Austin Rice. I'm the VP of Ecosystem at the Stellar Development Foundation, um, where I work with people to understand how to use the network, developers and enterprises. Um, at the SDF, our goal is to support the open source, open participation Stellar network, of which you will hear a lot about in a minute, um, in order to increase equitable access to the world's financial infrastructure. Marta. Oh. And yeah, I'm Marta Lakova. I'm a software engineer on the Stellar Core team um, at Stellar Development Foundation. And so I work on the actual implementation of a distributed ledger, which is what power powers uh, the Stellar network. Um, so really excited to be here with you. We ready? All right, we are going to dive in. This is going to be a fairly in-depth explanation of Stellar and of the blockchain technology that powers it. Um, we're gonna talk for a while, I'm gonna talk for a while, hand it to Marta, and then we'll probably pause about halfway through for questions. And then we'll sort of dig, roll up our sleeves and sort of do a little bit of playing around with the actual network. So technical deep dive into Stellar. <clears throat> Quick agenda, I'll explain how the Stellar network works. I guess I just sort of went through this, give it to Marta to talk about how it compares to other blockchains. And then we will talk about sort of open source and an open source project. And then we'll use the Stellar laboratory and leave some time for Q&A. Okay, the Stellar Network. The Stellar Network is made up of nodes. Nodes, 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 what are nodes? Um, nodes are computers that connect and communicate with one another to keep a common accounting ledger and to approve and ratify changes to it. So on the image on the right, all those dots, those are nodes. Uh, Stellar's open participation, so anyone can spin up one of these nodes and they run this thing called Stellar Core that Marta helps build. Um, it's decentralized because these nodes are run by independent individuals and organizations all over the globe. So each of those dots is a computer running Stellar Core to communicate. Um, the common ledger that nodes work together to keep yeah, so it's like stable. Here, uh, physics major in the college. Nice. And you guys are all... Uh... Students, can you please um, mute your microphones? Thank you. I thought that was like a, like just like a coming in hot with a question at the top. <laughs> And I would, I approved that, uh, that level of verve and engagement. Um, okay. Ledger, understanding the ledger. So I said that nodes work to keep a common ledger. It's stable, it's secure, it's transparent, stable because the network is spread over a bunch of servers and computers all over the world. So you can't turn it off. There's not a central server. It's secure um, because the ledger entries are immutable, right? Once a transaction has been processed, no one can change the data or manipulate the numbers to their liking. And it's transparent because like many blockchains, like all block, public blockchains, everyone can see the ledger and trust that the information is correct. That's the ledger. So nodes keep the ledger and what's on the ledger? Well, accounts. Accounts, 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 accounts are the essential data structure in Stellar. They're saved on this global ledger. Um, they hold balances, they sign tr transactions. They also issue assets. An account access is controlled by public private key cryptography. So every Stellar account has a public key. Usually they start with G. Um, and every account also has a secret key, which always starts with an S. The public key is safe to share, right? That's how people identify your account. That's how they verify you authorize a transaction. It's kind of like your email address. People need to know it to send you an email. That reference feels probably dated to many of you. Um, your secret key, however, is private information that proves that you own your account. It's like your password, you can't share it with anybody. You use your secret key to sign transactions, which essentially call functions that change the state of the ledger. So transactions, that's the next word. Transactions, transactions, transactions. Transactions on Stellar are made up of operations, which are the actual functions that change the ledger. So a payment, that's an operation. An offer to buy an asset, to sell an asset, that is an operation. Now, this is stellar vernacular here. It's a little confusing because operations, honestly, that's what most people think of when they think of transactions. But on Stellar, you can actually bundle 100 operations into a single transaction. You can put them in a specific order. They execute in that order. You can use that to do some interesting things. We won't get into it right now. But when I say operations, you can kind of think transactions. Most transactions, in fact, consist of a single operation. Um, each of the entries that you see in this example ledger, that's a single operation transaction. So Lisa sends me $50. Thank you, Lisa. Transactions are timestamped um, and they contain unique identifying information. And every three to five seconds, those nodes that we talked about earlier, they bundle all the transactions together into a set. They apply that set to change the state of the ledger. 
let us walk through that process. So it all starts with a ledger, which is, again, is essentially a list of accounts and balances. It's like a giant spreadsheet in a SQL database. Um, users, wherever they are in the world, they submit transactions to send and exchange assets on the network. Some of these are individual users with Stellar wallets. Some of these are businesses using B, making B2B payments. And using Stellar, they can move funds anywhere in the world. They can convert currency along the way, thanks to a built-in system of exchange that includes order books and automated market makers, which we will talk about later. Um, these transactions are essentially bundled into sets. They're confirmed by validating nodes. They are applied to the ledger, at which point they're final and create an immutable record. And then the whole process starts over. So why is a blockchain ledger immutable? Like, why can't someone change the previous entries on the ledger? How do these transaction sets come together and get finalized anyway? To answer those questions, I'm gonna pass the mic to Marta, who's gonna dig in and explain how blockchain protocols work generally, and also how the Stellar Consensus Protocol works specifically. Marta. Hello, Justin, thank you. Always great to hear you talk about these things. So um, yeah, so let's dive a bit deeper into um, technical aspects of the Stellar Network and the Stellar Consensus Protocol in particular. So to do this, we're going to put things into perspective. We're going to compare Stellar to two biggest blockchains out there, Bitcoin and Ethereum. So let's start with the intended function of these three blockchains. So Bitcoin was the first blockchain to show a decentralized, completely native um, uh, store of value, a completely internet native store of value, excuse me. So we think of it as the first internet native uh, money. Uh, recently, more and more people have been referring to um, Bitcoin as digital gold uh, due to its uh, scarcity and potentially a way to beat inflation. But in this talk, we're just going to focus on kind of the initial um, goal of Bitcoin as outlined in the Bitcoin paper, which is uh, digital money. On the other hand, um, Ethereum acts as a general purpose decentralized computer. So what I mean here is that it provides infrastructure for developers to write programs or smart contracts that can really execute anything. So this allows a variety of different applications on the Ethereum network. So things like NFTs or borrowing, lending applications, asset issuance, and so forth. And so finally, Stellar focuses on payments. So Stellar is really good for fast and cheap payments, as well as issuing digital assets on the network. For example, on Stellar, you can issue stable coins such as USDC. So next, let's compare consensus mechanisms for each of these blockchains. So Bitcoin and Ethereum both use proof of work, uh, which we're going to discuss in a lot more detail in the next slide. Um, but for now, I also wanted to note that Ethereum is actually uh, in the process of a major upgrade as they're moving away from uh, proof of work towards proof of stake. Um, so while the intended uh, proof of stake model actually has some better properties when it comes to securities and scalability, um, in this talk, we'll mostly focus on the current state uh, of Ethereum. Um, and then, so for Stellar, um, it actually uses a completely different approach to consensus. Specifically, it uses federated Byzantine agreement, which is implemented via the Stellar consensus protocol to achieve consensus. So let's actually dive a little deeper and um, try to understand what differ differentiates all these consensus mechanisms. So first, I just want to kind of step back and emphasize that a consensus mechanism is vital for the security of the blockchain. Uh, it is essentially what allows all the nodes on the blockchain to agree on something in a safe way. Um, if nodes don't agree on transaction in a safe way, it opens up a possibility for double spend attack. So a double spend attack is essentially spending the same money twice. Um, a quick example here, imagine paying $5 for parking, but then spending the same $5 to buy an ice cream. So you receive the goods for a total of value of $10, meaning that you got the parking space time and you got an ice cream, yet you only paid $5 for everything. So consensus mechanisms want to ensure that such a scenario can't happen. So now let's dive a little deeper into what a proof of work system is. So to reach consensus, nodes need to agree on transactions to confirm in the next block. Uh, in, in proof of work systems, each validator solves a very difficult math problem that requires a lot of computational resources. Um, it is also proven that there's no shortcut to the solution. So the only way to get to the right answer is to actually perform the computation, i.e. show the proof of work. Um, so validators, uh, the first validator that uh, solves that problem essentially gets to create the next block. 
And then uh, validators that cre create that block, they broadcast it to everyone else on the network. So as other nodes on the network discovered the new block, uh, they basically accept it uh, since it's, it's essentially a longer chain. And then uh, once they accept it, they can start working on the next block on top of that newly created block. So here again, I want to kind of emphasize that validators on the network accept the longest chain. So if the validator is first to mine the block, it basically creates that longer chain that is later discovered and accepted by others. Uh, so another thing uh, about proof of work is that validators are incentivized to participate in the block creation that we just discussed because uh, they receive monetary rewards in the form of coins for producing these new blocks. And you might have heard uh, about, about this. This process is called mining and it's very popular. So now let's shift gears a little bit and talk about how Stellar approaches consensus. Um, it's actually a completely different consensus mechanism because there are no computationally heavy tasks. So instead, nodes select other nodes on the network that they trust, and they exchange messages with those nodes to agree on a set of transactions to confirm in a particular block. And we call these sets of trusted nodes quorum slices. So let's unpack what quorum slices actually mean. So to understand how consensus is reached on Stellar, let's first look at the examples of, of these quorum slices that we just discussed. So recall that a quorum slice is a set of nodes that a validator uh, chooses to trust. On the right, we have a network of four nodes, uh, A, B, C, and D. And we express trust relationship between these nodes uh, with arrows. So for example, A has B and C in its quorum slice, and another example is node B. It has uh, A, C, and D in its quorum slice. Um, so now that we know what quorum slices are, let's define quorum. So quorum is a non-empty set of nodes that contains a slice for each member. So for example, A, B, and C is not a quorum. Why? Well, because it actually does not contain a slice, full slice for B and C. If you look at the diagram, uh, so you see that D is in the quorum slice for both B and C. Uh, so it must be in the quorum. On the other hand, A, B, C, and D is a quorum because it includes a slice for each member. So now that we know what quorum slices and quorums are, the key detail of consensus uh, on Stellar is that network, the network only confirms a block if a quorum agrees on that block. So it needs the agreement of a whole quorum to confirm the transactions. Great, so now that we've talked a little bit about consensus, let's uh, switch to uh, open participation. So what does it mean to have open participation? Uh, it means that there's no central authority allowing or preventing you from participating on the network, meaning that anyone can join and start validating transactions and participating in consensus. And we wanted to include this feature because it's just so vital for decentralization. As, and as you can see, all three networks have that, but we thought it was important to include uh, this feature as well. All right, cool. So next, uh, we have some key security properties to go over. So it, as you can see, Bitcoin and Ethereum prefer liveness and Stellar prefers safety. And you're probably very confused because I haven't defined either li liveness or safety. So we're going to unpack this. So we're not going to spend too much time on the actual computer science theory here, but the most import important point that I want to convey is that there are three desired properties that consensus mechanisms always want to have. So uh, those are safety, liveness, and full tolerance. What do they mean? So safety is a guarantee that all nodes produce the same block, the same valid block, meaning that nodes can't produce contradicting block, blocks. Liveness guarantees that nodes will eventually produce a new block and won't just halt and you know, be non-responsive. Be non and then finally, fault tolerance ensures that the network can tolerate uh, node failure. So either nodes going down or actually becoming malicious and sending like conflicting messages uh, to other nodes. So in distributed systems, it is proven that uh, you can only have two out of three of these properties. And typically, um, consensus protocols always want to guarantee fault tolerance. And because consensus protocols select fault tolerance, they're left with deciding between safety and liveness. So what exactly happens when either safety or liveness are selected? 
So if we choose safety, which guarantees that all nodes will produce the same block, nodes will get stuck until they can, they can all produce the same block. Remember, safety means that nodes can't produce differing blocks. On the other hand, if we choose liveness, nodes choose to produce a block, any block, uh, meaning that they choose to stay alive, but they may produce a block that uh, will later be overridden by a different block as, as the network advances in consensus. Uh, so this, this potentially invalid block is actually what can open up a possibility for a, a double spend attack. And we'll look into example of this um, a little bit closer in the next slide as well. Yeah, so let's see a visual example of how liveness is picked over safety. Um, so here, yeah, each clipboard icon basically represents a block. And so as new blocks are propagated on the network, uh, nodes can learn about it at different speeds. So it's actually possible for two blocks on the network to have a different view of the blockchain. Um, so remember how nodes choose to follow the longest chain in proof of work systems. Um, but what if some nodes haven't learned about the longer chain yet? Uh, so they continue to follow the chain uh, that they currently consider the longest. And this is how you can end up with a different view of the blockchain as we try to show in, in this example. So on the other hand, uh, let's look at the network that prefers safety over liveness, which is what Stellar Consensus Protocol does. So the, the important thing to uh, realize here is that a split uh, that we had in proof of work systems can actually never happen because Stellar Consensus Protocol prefers or chooses safety over liveness. So instead, uh, nodes hold if they can't agree on the same block. Uh, so if there is no quorum uh, that agrees on a particular block, nodes just hold and stop processing transactions. So we just covered some important security properties. Um, let's actually see how long it takes to confirm a transaction on these blockchains. So every Bitcoin block takes about 10 minutes, uh, while Ethereum blocks block is about 13 seconds. Uh, note that we also included the number of confirmations uh, needed to consider the transaction final. And this data is uh, from, from Coinbase. So remember that in proof of work systems, nodes continue producing blocks and as they discover newer blocks on the network, uh, they might switch to a longer chain, potentially abandoning the previous chain that they considered longest. So because of this, we typically want to wait uh, for the network to confirm several blocks um, after your transaction made it into a block. So, um, and this is needed to reduce the chances of the network switching to another longer uh, chain. And so on Coinbase, uh, as you see uh, in a, in a in the table, uh, users wait for three confirmations uh, for Bitcoin transactions. And on Ethereum, it's 35 confirmations. So this is completely different on Stellar. Uh, there's actually no need to wait because exactly because of the feature that we just described in the previous slide, where uh, Stellar prefers safety over liveness. So because the agreement of the whole quorum is needed in order to produce a block, once a block is produced, um, operators can be sure that the block won't later be revoked. So once it's confirmed, it, it, it's confirmed. Um, and on Stellar, um, a block is produced every five seconds and um, only one confirmation is needed to deem the transaction final, uh, exactly for the reasons that we just described. Okay, so now let's also uh, look at the average transaction costs. So again, we averaged the data um, over the past 12 months. Um, as you can see, it's quite different acro across these uh, networks. And um, I just also wanted to kind of point out that uh, these fees fluctuate as they depend a lot on how much competition there is uh, for a particular transaction to be included in the block. But uh, kind of the, the most important point that that I want to make here is that is, is the order of magnitude difference between Stellar and these other networks, despite the fact that these fees uh, fluctuate. All right, so now let's talk about sustainability. Uh, so as you can see, uh, proof of work systems require high energy consumption um, and energy consumption on Stellar is quite low. Uh, and why is that? So remember how we said that in uh, proof of work systems, nodes try to solve a 
heavy computational task as fast as they can. Uh, so this is directly related to energy impact. So heavy computational tasks require a lot of CPU, which in turn requires a lot of power. And in proof of work systems, validators are essentially incentivized to have high quality hardware that uses a lot of power in order to increase their chances of producing the next block. This is different on Stellar. So because Stellar does not require computationally intensive operations to reach consensus, and instead it has uh, nodes establish trust relationship with each other and just exchange messages to reach consensus, this can actually be done on a very modest hardware and it does not require a lot of power. All right, so we just talked a lot uh, about a lot of things. And the final feature that I want to talk about uh, is resistance to 51% attacks. So what are these attacks? Um, so again, remember that in proof of work systems, nodes that solve a computationally heavy task, they get to produce the next block. So this is also directly related to how much computational power a validator has. Um, if a validator has a lot of computational power, it is more likely to win the block race and have the network accept that block. This means that if validators uh, with over 50% of the computing power become malicious, they have the ability to take over the network and dictate every subsequent block. So as an example, if a top few miners in a Bitcoin network colluded, or for example, a large government felt threatened by Bitcoin and invested a lot of resources um, into mining rigs, the network could be taken over. So on Stellar, such an attack is not possible because computing power is not a feature of consensus. On Stellar, nodes choose other nodes that they trust to decide which transactions to confirm in the blog. Nodes do not accept a block based on computational power. So this means that even if an attacker adds a million nodes to the network, this will not impact consensus as long as nodes in the network do not add those malicious nodes to the quorum slices. Um, and so usually nodes on Stellar add organizations that they trust to the quorum slices. So this means an attacker will need to convince other nodes but to, you know, on the network to add attackers nodes to the quorum slices, which uh, can, can be difficult. All right, great. So to summarize, uh, the Stellar Consensus Protocol is a federated Byzantine agreement, which um, allows for open membership to support growing decentralization. Uh, it has low latency, which allows fast transaction times. It is resistant to malicious actors and 51% attacks, and it prefers safety over liveness to prevent forks. And I know I just said a bunch of things. I'm going to stop here and see if there are any questions before giving back to Justin. Any takers, any questions about consensus protocols, about the stellar consensus protocol? I'm always thinking that I trip over federated Byzantine agreement system sometime and I'm like, oh, we should, I wanna call it proof of vote or something. That's not a question. Shy students, if you have questions, sometimes they put them in the chat too, Marta. Um, oh uh, yeah, right. we can do chat as well. Oh, somebody I, raise I a hand. I encourage you guys to ask questions. Yeah. Tobias, uh, raise a hand, yes. Yeah, hi, I was wondering if, um, so if when you're talking about security or safety versus liveness like yeah. how does seller have low isn't the what's the benefit of live of like liveliness if the speed for transactions is still faster on like stellar like why would anyone choose to value liveliness um i i think it's just that those consensus protocols are like completely different like um so on stellar for example yeah you prefer safety but then you have to also select your quorum set correctly and make sure that it's actually configured correctly, which can be sometimes like difficult. And so like, you know, on this proof of work systems, I think that's just like a feature of consensus. Um, yeah, because, uh, you know, these, you, you can basically have like multiple chains at the same time. And because it's a distributed system and, you know, these computers need to learn about these different chains on the proof of work system, um, then they can have like a partial view um, of the network uh, at the time. So uh, I'm not sure if that uh, answers yeah, your question. Yeah, 
Well, you know, one thing I, I sometimes think about with Stellar is like the validators on the network are known entities. So as Marta pointed out, like they have to trust one another. They have to opt into adding entities to their quorum set. They know who those people are. And so when you value safe, uh, safety, right, if the network halts, what that means is that, remember, it's a decentralized network. Nobody has the ability to turn it off. No one can just turn it back on either, right? Like you actually have to coordinate validators if a network halts. And so I almost also think that like one feature, one necessity for like a, a network that does value safety over liveness is that the validators have to be able to find one another, right? To, to restart the network if something goes wrong. And I think on a lot of like in, in networks that are proof of work where miners are basically like anonymous, um, I don't even know if that would be possible. Yeah, and I think like because um, Stellar was designed for payments, like it was really important that if you know if if something happens, like some kind of split in the network, like everybody just stops. Uh, you know, there's there's no kind of forking and and continue on two different views of the world. Um, if nobody can agree on one view of the world, everybody just halts. So it's kind of like a important feature given how the network is used. You know, like for payments, for like cross border payments, um, and like assets. Any other questions? Thank you, Marta. That was awesome. All right, I'm going. Okay, I'm picking it up and I'm talking about open source contribution. So all of that that Marta talked about is super awesome. That is, there is a code base that sort of all these nodes run that allow them to run, to sort of uh, talk to one another, to vote, to come to consensus, to ratify transactions. And a fundamental ethos behind the development of that code base, and it's part of what makes me love SDF, is that it's open source, right? Anyone can review the code, anyone can contribute to the code, no one owns the, owns the code, right? It's open, it's free, it's participatory. You listening can join the good fight today. You can work on the code, all you need is a GitHub account. Um, there's a wide world of innovative Stellar developers, and while many of them are focused on building their own apps and services that make use of the network, which we'll talk about in a second, the sort of application layer, many are also contributing to helping evolve the software that powers the network itself. Um, and that software that powers the network, it never sits still. It's constantly being iterated, improved on, worked on in order to fulfill the needs of the ecosystem, including all the projects that are built at the application level. So here's a question. If you have this code base and it's evolving and no one owns it, well, how does it evolve? And I'm gonna talk about that quickly, two main ways, core advancement proposals and stellar ecosystem proposals, bear with me here. Core advancement proposals, CAPS. This is a method that we sort of came up with, the foundation, actually, I don't even know who started it, but at this point it is a, a codified process to allow contribution to come in and amend and update the code that runs Stellar Core that Marta talked about. So core advancement proposals, they're suggested changes to the protocol of Stellar. They have a direct effect on how the network operates. Um, there are about 40 plus of them. Each one outlines a specific change and they're used to add new features to the network itself. So a recent example is one called fee bump transactions, which allows fees to be paid by any account on the network and it enables an application to cover its users' transaction fees. Now, network fees are handled at the protocol level. So this new feature, it required a new operation to be built into the protocol. And that's why it had to be implemented in Stellar Core. And that's why it was a cap, a core advancement proposal. Had to be done that way. Incidentally, we just added automated market making functionality to Stellar Core cap 38. I'm not going to get into it right now, but it was super cool two weeks ago. Um, so CAPS, they have a life cycle, right? It's, it's, it's a multi-step process to ensure it's high quality and backwards compatible. For CAP to be qualified, classified as final and go live on the network, it has to go through all these stages, has to be implemented in the code. But then fundamentally, before it actually hits the network, it has to be accepted by a majority of the network validators. Validators vote on the protocol number the network runs using the same stellar consensus protocol they use to ratify transactions. So governance wise, Anyone can contribute to code. Code can be implemented, but before it is actually adopted, the network has to give it the thumbs up. 
Now that's different, that count process is different than the other kinds of standards that live outside of the Stellar Code, Stellar Ecosystem Proposals, SEPs for short. These deal with changes to the standards and methods used to build on top of the network. Um, again, there are 40 plus of these for various purposes. They're labeled by numbers. These don't alter the Stellar Code, but they are technical blueprints that allow developers to agree on how services using the network should be implemented to allow for maximum interoperability. So basically a lot of the times these say, here's how to set up an extra network API. Uh, they detail like sort of two sides of an interaction, a server side, how to create the API, and the client side, how to consume the API. Um, again, they also follow a, 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 a life cycle from draft to final. I'm gonna give you an example so this is less abstract. SEP31 is a standard that allows businesses to make compliant cross-border payments on behalf of two users. So imagine a user wants to make a traditional remittance payment, right? They log into a remittance provider's website, they provide funds and they enter information about the recipient and they wanna have the money just show up in the recipient's account. They don't even know they're using Stellar but they're working with companies that have integrated Stellar on the back end. So to complete, the, to complete the transaction and comply with regulations, the remittance provider, they actually need to know the recipient's bank account and routing number, and they need to collect KYC information about the recipient. And to do all that, the receiving, and they need to share it with the receiving party, right? So uh, there isn't a direct path between two user Stellar account on network. And so instead, uh, the anchors uh, will uh, create use a set to create these extra network APIs that allow them to share KYC information. Okay, that was sort of a lot. Again, that was the code. Uh, Marta talked about the actual consensus protocol. Those two things, steps and caps, were the ways that the code evolves. Um, but in truth, um, interacting with Stellar is actually quite simple because we're actually gonna move way up the stack now. So most developers who are building on Stellar, they aren't necessarily working on SAP, caps or SEPs. They aren't necessarily thinking about the protocol level or interacting with Stellar Core in the raw every day. They're using an SDK, a software development kit in their preferred language. And those SDKs are interacting with a network API called Horizon. So this three-tiered stack of responsibilities it sort of divides things so that each piece of software can focus on its specific purpose, right? Stellar Core concentrates on transaction submission and consensus. Horizon provides an ergonomic interface to allow people to submit to, to actually interact with the network. And SDKs kind of abstract away the complexity in a variety of different languages. Um, so when you're developing on Stellar, you can, for the most part, kind of not think about what's going on in the hood, at least not all the time. And you can just use an intuitive REST API to submit transactions, query network data, it's actually pretty cool, but again, that feels a bit abstract. So let's make it concrete. Um, we actually have a thing called the Stellar Laboratory. This is a handy tool that you can use to build, sign, and submit transactions to the network. And you can use it to query all the API endpoints. Um, and to understand what that means and how to use it, we're gonna do something quickly right now. I hope this works. We're going to issue an asset. So we're going to do it on the test net, which is the development sandbox for Stellar. It's just like the main public network, but it's not connected to real world money. So this is the process for issuing an asset. On the test net, it would be the same for the real network. Quick overview. Okay. And issuing an asset requires a number of steps. And the basic way to do this, which is covered in the developer docs, the easiest way to do this is to create two accounts. One is an issuing account and one is a distribution distribution account, because in order to issue an asset on Stellar, one account has to trust the other to give it the asset, and then that account has to make the payment. This might seem weird, but you'll see what it looks like in action. Um, and so I'm going to now open Stellar Laboratory. Let's see. Are you seeing Stellar Laboratory? You can not. Okay, this is Stellar Laboratory, and as you can see, it's on the test network. Um, I first want to create two new um, Stellar accounts. So this is what we will call the issuing account. It's really crazy. Uh, and then because in real life, you would need to actually fund this. Uh, every Stellar account requires a minimum balance of lumens in order to exist on the ledger to prevent spam. In real life, you'd have to fund it with real lumens, but again, we're on the test network. So I can just get test network lumens now this account has its minimum balance. That is my issuing account. I'm generating a second account. This will be the distribution account. Okay, distribution. Saving these on a 
handy spreadsheet. In reality, you would be very careful with these keys. Um, and again, I've generated that key pair, but I need to fund it. And so again, this is Stellar Laboratory. And what I've just done is created two new accounts. But as you can see up here at the top, there's all these different tabs that you can use to actually understand what's going on. On the Stellar network, you can actually build, sign, submit transaction, and explore endpoints. So to start with, we're just going to build a couple of transactions. And what we are essentially doing is we are taking that second account that we created, which is the distribution account. I'm adding it here. I say fetch the next sequence number. I set the fee. I'm not going to worry about time bounds, but this is me constructing a transaction. And the operation type is going to be change trust. So to change trust, I'm going to basically believe in an asset that exists called the UCI that is actually issued by the issuing account. So again, what I'm doing here is with the distribution account, I'm trusting the issuer account for an asset called UCI. I'm basically going to see that I have generated the right transaction envelope, and I'm going to sign this in the transaction signer. Let's hope this works. So I need, for that, I need the secret key, if you'll recall. I need the secret key of the account. Let's see if I do this right. And then I can submit the transaction in the transaction split. This is a three to five seconds. As you can see, I submitted the transaction and the transaction is complete. Again, this interface you can use to sort of create any kind of transaction. I'm gonna do one more transaction really quickly, which is basically with the issuing account, I'm going to make a payment. So I'm putting in the issuing account now, I'm fetching the next sequence number. I'm going to create a payment operation. Uh, this always makes me nervous. And I'm going to send it to that distribution account. So here is a distribution account. It's going to be you chai, that asset that I created. And I'm gonna send, I don't know, 13, 13, 13, that many. Again, I can sign this with the public key for the issuing account. So again, this all feels a bit strange, but I'm going to wrap it all together so nicely in the end. And once I sign it, I can submit the transaction. Let's hope it works. Transaction submitted. Okay. So what I just did was that I basically created two accounts. One is an issuing account that actually creates and sends the asset in a distribution account. The distribution account essentially linked to the issuing account and said, I trust you to send me an asset. And the issuing account made a payment to the uh, distribution account. And now that account will hold a balance of the asset. And that was basically, we just issued an asset on seller. You can issue any asset that represents anything with any asset code. And it's just as simple as that. It's just a few things that you can do in this interface, or you can do it with an SDK. Now, one final thing, as I mentioned, Horizon is an endpoint. I mean, is an API that has different endpoints. And this uh, interface, the Stellar Laboratory, will actually show you how to construct various queries to the Horizon endpoints. So right now, if I go to Horizon and I sort of query the uh, distribution account, what it should have is a balance of this asset that we just created. Whoops. So I'm going to put it here. And you will see that, in fact, if I scroll down to the JSON response, that It does have a balance of this huge shy asset. So what I essentially did was issue into this account a new asset that never existed before on the ledger. Now, part of what's cool is that this actually happened on a test network that replicates the real network. And all of that payment, all that issuance was actually done on multiple nodes. And now I'm going to open just like a totally different thing. This Stellar Expert is a block explorer for uh, the Stellar network. It's not something that we built. It's not something that we maintain. It's actually maintained by a, a company in, in Ukraine, right? And this is basically a way to view actions on the Stellar network. And I can, it's set up to view the test network. So I can actually go to a totally different third-party interface. I can look up the key, right? And I can see that 
oh, look, there is the public key. There's the asset that, that it issued. There's its balance. Here are the transaction history. Here's what we just did. And like, this is sort of the way that it fundamentally works is that using this API, you can create issue, you can uh, create payments, uh, make payments, issue assets. And all of that activity is actually done on this sort of like common blockchain that you can view from almost any other source. Um, and so that is asset issuance on Stellar. And now I accidentally stopped sharing my presentation. Sorry. Okay. Um, is there more to do here? Uh, and so there you go. Uh, those, those features, right? The ability to issue assets that allow you to build an interoperable world because all kinds of companies or single devs can sort of build issue assets, build interfaces that connect to the blockchain. Um, and it is very easy to get started, right? Stellar again, supports common development languages, JavaScript and Python. There's extensive documentation. Developers can build and operate on the network with very few resources. And there is this test network. Um, and we have great documentation, which you can find at developers.stellar.org. Uh, so for anyone who is sort of here and wants to build on Stellar, you can get started immediately. I guess the final thing that I do want to say, so, oh no, there's way more. Um, the next thing that I want to say is that also, if you're interested in learning more about Stellar and doing some hands-on stuff with that laboratory, I would suggest that you go to quest.stellar.org. Um, and after signing up with Discord and your Albedo wallet, you can basically compete in quests to win an NFT badge. And several times a year, there are live series where you can compete. This is basically a gamified intro to Stellar that lets you learn. And if you're going to do it, I recommend starting with the practice quests. Um, start with quest one, and you'll need to create an account like I just did. And then it will sort of walk you through processes that you need to, uh, the resources that you need to complete the quest. And you'll get a set of keys. And once you submit the right transactions, and you can use that Stellar Laboratory interface, you can basically verify your solution, claim an NFT. Um, it's super fun, even if you don't know how to code, because you can use that interface. And if you run into issues, you can always ask questions in our vibrant community, uh, we have a Discord server of, for Stellar questers. Um, and actually, that was it. So if you want to find out more about Stellar, uh, go to stellar.org. Again, I recommend using um, Stellar Quest to keep learning. And that was a fairly deep dive. So again, it was we looked at SCP. We looked at the Stellar stack. We looked at basically the interface and how you can issue an asset. And then finally, Stellar Quest, the gamified way to learn more about Stellar. And now. We'll open it up for questions.